I'm going to slightly reflect on it from the point of view of uh, machine learning and uh, material science. And uh, a few years ago, I learned that there is this new hyped field of data science. And uh, when I talked to my colleagues about it, they were some of them felt a really little bit offended because they saw that uh, naming something data science is like na naming coffee caffeinated coffee because science is all about data. And uh, I will talk, I, I'll need to first limit my uh, talk. So there might be other scientific disciplines where, for example, people enjoy other people. And uh, there are material science is intrinsically a statistical physics. So there's a lot of statistics, a lot of uh, weights, and uh, you need to deal with some uh, ensemble properties, like temperature, for example, is not a single barrier, but something averaged uh, along the system. Uh, this talk is based on my limited experience. I don't have any superpowers, so I don't possess an unlimited experience. And uh, yes, I have to say that I, my, it is my opinion, and uh, it's not related to the place where I work now. Uh, the other argument that people tell to use when they complain about data science that we already know as a scientist that uh, like when your data is big or when your system gets big, it's something different. And they usually uh, tend to cite this physical paper which is 45 years old, which I assume uh, quite some time ago. <laughs> uh, which is a reflection of very good uh, physicists on that you, you cannot just scale up and uh, keep expecting that you will get the same uh, descriptive power of your system and will have the same results. So nowadays, those who do theoretical physics, when you first, when I usually, in those rare events, when I go to parties and I introduce myself as a theoretical physicist, they tend to think that I'm some sort of a guy from uh, the theory of Big Bang uh, or some other, I don't even know how that's properly called. Uh, well, in fact, the theoretical physics is much more, and uh, that is sort of m my point that annoys me that the stuff that they do in CERN in theoretical physics is like one-sixth of all the published theoretical physics paper. Like, for example, there is this field of uh, fluid dynamics, which is also can be studied theoretically. We will, I guess, hear about this in the next presenter. So what is exactly the more? Uh, this guy with a really creepy eyesight is Italian. And he used to give me a lot of nightmares in school. And he was like a really clever dude who formulated something that if you have this uh, amount of uh, gas in uh, two pressures and two volumes are the same, they would have the similar number of elements, which was really tricky to decipher. So the people decided to rephrase it in this uh, Avogadro constant. And it, this definition doesn't say, at least me, much. It's just to say that, well, if we have something that is like one mole, then it has this amount of molecules or particles or something. Uh, so basically, this is a dimensionless variable, which is really, really big. Uh, one mole at standard conditions is roughly 22.4 liters. And when we had a uh, coffee break, there was 90 bottles like that. So it's basically two moles in volume. If those bottles were occupied by an ideal gas, that was just uh, 12 to the power of 10 to the power of 23. Uh, not the power of times. Uh, that is quite a lot. But if it was filled with something more dense, for example, with graphite or with carbon more specifically, it just takes 12 grams of graphite to have one mole of uh, atoms of carbon. When atoms exist, they usually have a lot of electrons around them. The electrons interact with the atoms, the atoms interact with other atoms, and so on. There are a lot of interactions. Those interactions cannot be easily uh, just written down as on a pen and paper. You can go to some approximations and do some cal cal calculations, but not anymore. Those people who tend to think that uh, they don't need programming or they don't need those technical tools typically end up 
studying really small class of problems. In computer uh, physics or like computational material science, there is this very really useful density functional theory, which basically uh, uses uh, a lot of axiomatical, mathematical strict statements to transfer from a really hard, complicated problem of a lo lots of uh, electrons and atoms acting with each other to a, s a lot of small interacting, non-interacting particles moving in an effective potential. So you had a uh, many-body problem of many interacting problems. You had one problem, you had many-body problem. Then you go to many non-interacting problems, and that is sort of the solution that this uh, idea solves. And uh, in principle, it is exact. There was a few days, not a few days, a few months ago, there was a publication by some very annoyed people who say that, well, you say that it's exact, but we're not really moving into finding an exact solution. But yeah, who cares? Um, so I was talking about uh, chemical elements, and all of those atoms and elements, they have different amount of electrons. So if you were to take, for example, I don't know, a piece of aluminum, and then compare it to a piece of uh, platinum, you would notice that they are a bit different. But a theoretical physicist, a uh, periodic table is basically like that. It's just a periodic table. And you don't really care what you are putting into your, <laughs> into your equation. Because what you care about is how many electrons this has. So basically, which position it occupies in your, period periodics, uh, peri in your periodic table. Uh, yeah, so you can basically just say that, okay, I have this system and uh, then this, this red element and then it's surrounded by blue elements. And then I'll say that let red be aluminum, let's calculate some properties, then replace red with beryllium, calculate some properties, then find which one works better. Uh, my colleague recently published a paper doing exactly that and he even was uh, featured in national paper. Uh, national magazine, so some fame or something. Uh, so I mentioned a few times that it's really hard to calculate it. That's only part of the problem. The problem is also to define how you talk about those systems, because in theoretical point of view, you have the infinite crystal with infinite symmetries and so on and so forth, and you can't really tell your computer that, oh, well, go from here to infinity, and maybe on infinity divided by two, do some, some other calculation. So you, you, you have to be clever when you, how you define these uh, uh, elements that you then can translate. Then you do some Fourier transformations, uh, accumulate some other properties, do some gradient descent to find the lowest uh, variable. And there are a lot of similar techniques that people use in data science, uh, which is an umbrella term for all uh, data analysis. So if your system can consist of just n small elements, then uh, typically you can calculate a few thousand elements if you don't include temperatures. Uh, if you include temperatures, then your calculation takes much longer and you, you tend to have less of them. Uh, since all the equations are partial, der partial derivative equations, it typically scales as n cubed. So if you want to test if you get the proper results, if you get the same result, if you get twice as big as the system, then it takes eight times longer to calculate that system. Of course, when you have a tricky system, when some of the atoms are not the same, then you lose some symmetry, you lose degrees of freedom, then you end up with really big cells and you cannot really do anything about it. So the method that I showed, the density functional theory, I think the modern standard of Hendon is like 100 or 200 of atoms, which is much less than one mole of or the Avogadro number. Uh, and it typically including that you would need some time to wait on a shared supercomputer cluster and everything, it usually takes about a month to get from a problem formulation to something that you can present or at least uh, discuss with your colleagues. If you include temperatures, then it's even longer because you have to gather statistics at some point. Uh, you basically calculate something statically, then you move atoms a bit according to this potential that electrons form, recalculate the new positions of electrons and uh, move further. 
uh, when you do this, you basically have three steps, almost like in a real uh, experiment. You first prepare the sample, then you put it into your, I don't know, the vacuum chamber, reach the equilibrium there, and then you measure it. Uh, similarly here, you prepare your initial uh, calculation parameters, then you run simulations, and then you process them. Uh, I put there that it's temperature-related simulation, but in fact it's for any type of simulation. It's just that in the case of temperature-related simulation, the second step really takes a lot of time. And it so happens that uh, people studied this problem for quite some time, and uh, basically everything is written in Fortran. And <laughs> Most of those codes are written in really obscure Fortran, like Fortran 77 or something like that. And they don't really want to go further because, well, it works. And uh, because of the way that Fortran has this, uh, a few leading uh, developers of the compilers, you can write quite uh, okay code and it still would be fast because the com compilers tend to really optimize everything. So, yes, on the second step, you basically stuck, stuck with Fortran and you can't use anything else. On the processing and the preparation step, there are a lot of other tools because they t tend to take less time. I personally used uh, Python in first and uh, third step, although in third step I found out when I first started using Python, it was really hard for me to learn the Matplotlib. And the first framework that I wrote in Python was to just create a lot of Nuplot inputs. For, from the from Python data, because it's much easier to work with Nuplot. Uh, so, for example, this is one of the example research. You, uh, those red points, those are points that typically take one month to calculate. And, uh, of course, if your super uh, supercomputer is big, you can calculate those red points in parallel, but it's not fast enough. And if you look at uh, the typical simulation, uh, it's not really noticeable that here, I'm sorry, but basically one-sixth of this simulation, you still have quite big oscillations there. So you tend to cut off the first uh, one-sixth here. It can be more, can be less, and then you have stuck with everything else for the simulation time. But still, it's uh, one-sixth of your computer power, which costs money, costs resources, time, uh, work clock time, and, and everything. But everything aside from calculation can be done in uh, any high-level language, like Python. There are some packages that help you to do that. There are some packages that try to write their own implementation of uh, the solver, but uh, they tend to be just stuck to one node. They're not really great at parallelizing it across a lot of machines for some reason. Uh, and yes, of course, there is a separate journal that just publishes a lot of uh, programs like that. Uh, Yes, so I think the main issue here is not really that the Python is not unusable. It's just that uh, a lot of people actually don't know about it. I once spent one, uh, one day explaining to my colleague how he can do some stuff in Python with a nice library. And then the next day I asked him, what he and did he succeed? And he said, nah, I just wrote everything in Fortran for some reason. So, I think it's really problematic if someone says that he rather writes something in Fortran than in Python. But I'm not sure if it, this is a case of uh, maybe that person was just lazy and arrogant. Uh, so the Fortran has a lot of libraries, which is nice. And uh, a lot of people use that. And as I said, for as long as there is some input processing, then Fortran people tend to suffer a lot, and then you can come and say, hey, do you want some Python? The first time is free. And then uh, I noticed that actual researchers are really similar to developers. They're smart, they're arrogant, they tend to just write their own solutions for the thing that already exists. They're lazy, and they both do complex things. things. They also tend to have a lot of uh, similar hobbies which is good because you can force them to communicate with each other. It's also really hard to convince a supervisor to spend resources like money to go to a computer class or a computer school or something, or buy some books. 
for something that is uh, related to programming skills. When I was applying to my undergraduate, like first year of university, I was going to um, apply for a department of uh, quantum electronics. And I was told explicitly not to mention that I have any programming experience because that would be like a frown upon for some reasons. Uh, so what can be done about this? I think if you have any friends in academia, they probably suffer and you, they think that it's, it's okay, but uh, it's just like, it's just a part of the game of being in academia. You can just try to show them that you can save some time and just ask them if they have any uh, computer problem that they suffer with. They might be open and then they, you'll have like a free beer or something. If you tend to go to a meetup or an organize one, please talk to your friends who might be in academia or just post it some uh, notices on a local university board or something. You might get some nice people to talk to because they will have the similar hobbies. Uh, yes, and uh, as I said, a lot of data science is all about classifications, just as a recent example as we saw. A lot of uh, science that is related to computational material science is all about regressions and uh, this is stigma is hard to beat. If you're bold enough there are some things like graduate schools when they are, do their own conferences and then you can sort of ask them if they need help to provide some tutorial, you might even get paid for it. Uh, and a lot of people use MATLAB and RStudio because they don't know that Jupyter exists and you can basically do the same and for them at first it would be no different for, I mean, they would suffer, but uh, still, they would suffer less than using MATLAB in the long run. In MATLAB, for example, you can't have file with a function that uh, the name of a function is different from a name of a file, which is very bizarre. When you talk to those scientists, probably you would need some authority, and uh, scientists really tend to believe what is published. There are two papers that are really which every of my colleagues have read. One is called 10 Simple Rules for Reproducive Computational Research, and it's just, in very simple ways, tells you that use version control system, don't use very weird parameters, just all the basic stuff that we all tend to think we know, and that everyone knows, but nobody actually talks about it. And uh, if you actually would like to work with some uh, materials data, there are a few databases, projects, most of them are most of them on this slide are in Europe, but there are one in the uh, US. In the US they have this materials genome project, which is quite a nice initiative. That they, uh, I think the materials project was founded uh, from that money. And it's a re re really interesting thing about this project that uh, they have this uh, about page when they basically list like all other similar projects to us, so basically our competitors in the sense that uh, we were inspired by those people and uh, you would never see s something like that in the industry when they open the about page like, oh, we, we, we do that, but there are also these guys who do the similar things, but <laughs> in academia that's pretty normal. Uh, so, yes, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention and, uh, yep, thanks.